All right. What was the lesson that the people of Israel learned when they were squeezed in between the Red Sea, the Egyptians, and mountains on each side? What was God teaching them to do there? Colin? All right. When they were in trouble, trust in Him. Call out to Him. Seek Him when something wasn't going right. We're going to see that it only takes a few days for the Israelites to forget that in this lesson. So lesson 48, water, quail, manna. We're going to start and we'll read from Exodus chapter 15, beginning here at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. They obviously filled up their canteens, okay, their whatever equipment it may be that they had to carry their water in with them in the wilderness. But within three days, when you have two million people and herds of animals that need the water, and you're in a dry, dusty desert, you run out. Okay. It's also, they're going through the wilderness of Shur. I had encouraged you to go to Google Earth and fly around and take a look at that land. What does that land look like there along the Red Sea? Kenton? It is not like a nice walk on the sandy soft beach or what we might think of the desert as a nice sandy place. It is a rocky, craggy, sharp area. Uneven, not fun to walk on. If you look at the images, you see how the cliffs, they're not just nice slow rising hills, but almost rocky cliffs that rise up. So on one side you have the sea, and on the other, you have these steep cliffs, not beautiful, gorgeous mountains like we think of maybe in Colorado, but these are a desolate place. Rocky, not in a great abundance of trees and shade and bushes. Where there are bushes, they're going to be very fragrant because they're few and far between, so they need to be very fragrant and bright for the insects to find them, to pollinate them. But it's a pretty desolate place. That's the kind of place that they are walking through. It's a place where enemies can easily hide in the hills, or thieves and robbers can find a cleft in a rock to hide in so that they can easily attack someone who's passing by. Now, a couple of men probably would not try to attack a group of two million people. That would be foolishness. But the idea here is that this is a dangerous, not very enjoyable place to travel through. Okay? And it is not probably a place that most of them would choose to travel through. Verse 23, And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve walls of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. You can imagine being an Israelite, first the joy of getting to leave Egypt and not having to work each and every day, and then the low point of being afraid that your enemies are going to die, and then the high point of watching your enemies die in the water and not having to be afraid of them, continuing on your journey, and then the low point again of this dry, desolate, not very enjoyable land that you're passing through. And now, after three days' journey, 
You can't go down to the Red Sea and get water from there. It's salt water. It's no good for you. You need to find fresh water someplace. They don't have time to stop and dig a well. That would That's done in a place where you permanently sit. So they're along the way waiting to find some water. And finally, after three days' journey, when they've won out of water, they come to a place where there's a large watering hole or pool. They go... You can imagine the first ones run there and scoop their hands down in the water or take a cup or whatever and put it in their mouth and as soon as it's into their lips they're spitting it out. <sighs> they don't want it. It is bitter. It's like biting into a, lemon, a sharp taste, a bitter taste. Something that is not enjoyable. Here they've come all this way. They're going to die of thirst. Now there's water but the water is bitter. What do the people do? Actually, we should ask maybe what don't they do that they should have done? Jennifer should have cried out to the Lord and prayed to Him. So they murmur, they complain, they whine. Moses intercedes for them when he hears them. He prays to the Lord, he cries out to them. And God shows Moses what? What does God show to Moses? What does he show to him here? Logan? Not just a branch, but a... Logan? A tree. It's a tree that thrives. It's probably a tree that thrived on those bitter waters. Take the tree. I had to be chopped down or not. don't know, but throw it into the waters. And that tree was a picture of the soaking up of the bitter taste of the waters. And that tree now made the water sweet. Did the tree actually make it sweet? No. God. Okay. But it's a picture here. Picture that God is taking them out of the bitterness. He's taking away the bitterness of Egypt. And he's giving them sweet life in Canaan. A picture of heaven. Of heavenly life with Jesus. And that is, that's a beautiful picture there with that tree. Okay? And so they can all, once again, fill up their canteens and their water jugs or whatever it may be. The animals can drink from the water. There's more than enough water there. And they begin to set out again. Now, Mara, we understand if you look at that map, Mara is about 33 miles from where they crossed the Red Sea. So it was three days' journey. Do a little math. How many miles are they going per day? Approximately, they just traveled 33 miles. It took three days. Joe, 11 miles a day. It's pretty good for a large group of 2 million people, plus herd and everything else. So that's about their pace. It's a pretty good pace. And after they fill back up on water here, at Mara, we read they leave and they head towards another place, just a little ways to the south, to a place called Elam. And there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And the people encamp here, they probably, we guess, stayed there for a month. They rested. You might think, well, why rest so long? It's a large group of people to move. Probably some mothers were worn out and fathers from carrying their little young children caring for babes. Okay? We've got to make sure they don't overwork the animals. But most importantly, they're taking a while because they need to learn to trust in God. Okay? And that brings us to something else that they're going to run out of next, and that will be food. Chapter 16, everyone take a look there. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The children of Israel said unto them, Would to God, we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, and we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them 
whether they walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the people of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt, and, the mount, and in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the morning flesh to eat, and in the mor- or in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth you murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So, what we see here, okay, is they run out of food. It's all gone. It's not like they can go out hunting in these hills to find enough food for two million people. Okay? They don't have the time and equipment to go fishing in the sea. And again, they're not going to draw out enough fish for two million people. What are they going to do? Again, what should they have done? What should they have done, Brody? Prayed to God and cried out to Him, but they didn't. They murmured and complained. And they specifically murmured and complained this time against Moses. It's you. You brought us out of Egypt. There in Egypt, we sat there by the flush pots, and we ate our bread to the full. Yes, we had to work, but at least we had enough food. Now you bring us out here to die of starvation. We have nothing. Moses prays to the Lord, and the Lord provides a way for them. He says to them, Each and every evening I will cause quails, small birds, and I will rain them, okay, so that you can take them and eat them. But in the morning when you arise, when you look out over the land, you are going to see a whiteness covering the land. You are going to see little things that look like wafers or crackers. There will be bread for you. What was it called? What do we call it? Kenton? Manna. Okay. So Moses scolds them. You aren't murmuring against us when you come and complain to me that you're going to die here in the wilderness. You're not really complaining to me. What you're really complaining to is God. When you sit there and you go to mom and dad, I'm bored. You're really complaining to the Lord that there's not enough things for you to do. Well, sure there is. You can help out mom and dad. Probably have plenty of activities and things that just sit on the shelves in your room or in your house somewhere that you could do something with. But we don't. It's murmuring against God. It's not murmuring to mom and dad. It's not murmuring to Moses. And that's foolish of them to wish, even sinful. What wickedness to say, we wish we had died in Egypt instead of you bringing us here. Now, not all the people complained. We have to understand that there were many godly who did not complain. But there were many ungodly who did complain. And even those who were godly, we complained too. So we can't say that we are without fault here too. We probably would have would have whined, complained. So he sends them quails in the evening, enough to feed two million people, and he sends them manna, or bread from heaven. Okay, Uh, We read, it had kernels in it, it's probably sweet like honey. Now what were some of the rules that they had to follow with this manna? You probably remember that from your years of having these lessons before. What were some of the rules of the manna? Amber, give me one. All right. Take enough for the day. First of all, if you didn't take enough in the morning, you would run out. You would be hungry. If you took too much, so that you thought, well, I'll just save some for tomorrow, and I could sleep in tomorrow morning and not go have to pick some up, what would you find in the morning in your bowl of manna sitting there? Kenton? Yeah, moldy, wormy. Would be no good. You couldn't eat it. You have to get up each and every morning. You have to go collect it. It's a picture of a dependence on God. We depend on him. Each morning we should wake up and go to God. Not run off and do what we want to do. Be lazy. Okay, so that's first. What's another picture? What, or what, I'm sorry, not was a picture. What was another rule with the manna? Kenton? On the sixth day, you can gather all the Sabbath. All right. For them, their Sabbath was on the seventh day, the last day of the week, which would be Saturday. So on Friday... Not only could they go out in the morning and gather a bowl full or a, however much, a basket full for that day, but go out and take another basket full so that you would have enough food for the Sabbath day. 
the day of rest. But that's not what some of them did. Some of them foolishly thought, ah, it'll come tomorrow, and then they were hungry. Okay? And probably the same. If you had too much and if it was left over, it would be wormy and no good on the next morning, on Sunday morning, when the first day of the week started for them. So that was also a rule. God didn't want to send manna on their worship day, their Sabbath day, on Saturday. So he told them, make sure on Friday you take enough for two days, and then it won't be wormy and moldy. Okay? So the people need to learn that. Like we said, they need to learn to trust in God. Each and every day, they will be dependent upon God. Okay? The manna was a wonder. It was a miracle. Now continuing on, let's see what happens there. Okay? Uh, verse 9, And Moses spake unto Aaron, saying to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. They saw a cloud there. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And then he gives some of the rules there. Okay, And then uh, continues on with a bunch of those rules up until verse 21. And then they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So it was there in the morning. If you got up early, before the sun rose high in the sky, you could gather enough. Not a problem at all. But as the sun began to rise in the sky and the heat began to hit the land, it began to melt. There was none left. So who is this manna a picture of? Who is the manna a picture of? Brody. Yeah, it's a picture of Jesus, who's the bread of life. Okay, this is, a, again, a picture of the people depending on God. Okay? So, if we look at your sheets, I do have that question there, B. How was the journey of Israel through the wilderness similar to our journey through life? I'm not walking on a rocky, craggy place between a, a sea and a mountain. I might think that that would be kind of interesting, but Amber... Okay, anything else, Brody? That's kind of what you were going to say. Yeah, it's a difficult journey. Our journey is difficult, not because of anything anybody else did, but because of our own selves, our sinful human nature. We have a, a difficult life. We're always battling against sin and what we know between what's right and wrong. And so we have a, a difficult journey too. It's just in a different manner. Instead of it being a physically difficult journey, it's more of a spiritually difficult journey. Okay? So, again, there are some beautiful things, pictures in this lesson. There are some lessons uh, for us as well from Psalm. I actually look up Psalm 105, verse 40. And again, the beauty of how we should behave, of praising God and thanking Him, because those who actually feared the Lord did not murmur and complain, but they knew that this was the will of the Lord. They probably woke up each morning, thanked God for His care for them, even knowing that this morning we had no more food. Who knows where it will come from. We will be hungry maybe. But they trusted in God. And God did deliver. So that's a good. Great many good lessons that we can take from, from this lesson here today.